So hello everyone, welcome back to the systemic embryology sessions. So today's topic is on the development of diaphragm. So diaphragm, in, diaphragm is a musculotendinous partition which separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. So diaphragm develops from septum transversum to, which is shown in purple in color. So here is the septum transversum which is a muscular component and which is supplied by the cervical myotomes. So these muscles are derived from the cervical myotomes, so mites from C3 to C5. Apart from septum transversum, even pleuroperitoneal membranes also gives rise to diaphragm. And dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. So here is the esophagus. And also the muscular growth in the uh, lateral body walls. The muscular ingrowth from the lateral body walls. So these are the sources which gives rise to diaphragm. So first regarding septum transversum, here is the septum transversum. So septum transversum, if we see its development, it is from the cervical somites uh, which uh, lies opposite to the cervical somites like C3, C4, C5. So during fourth week of development and uh, that is the reason it is supplied by the phrenic nerve. So here are the cervical somites, C3, C4, C5, this is septum transversum. So the muscular component of the cervical myotomes uh, that is C3 to C5 forms, a pass, uh, forms the muscular component of the septum transversum. So this explains that the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve and which is through the fibrous pericardium uh, from pleuroperitoneal folds. Septum transversum forms the central tendon of diaphragm. So here is the central tendon of diaphragm which is shown in whitish in color. So this central tendon is derived from septum transversum. Septum transversum forms the central tendon of diaphragm and this uh, central tendon is not enough to separate the thoracic and the abdominal cavities as uh, there are structures like pericardio-peritoneal canals on each side. So on each side the communication is formed by perito-pericardial canals which are present on each side of the developing foregut. So the large part of the liver bud is embedded in the septum transversum. So the connective tissue of the liver is also derived from the septum transversum. Next about this pleuroperitoneal membranes. Pleuroperitoneal membranes, these membranes fuse with septum transversum and dorsal mesentery to form a primitive diaphragm. So here we know these are the pleuroperitoneal membranes which are present on each side of the developing esophagus. So the pleuroperitoneal membranes develop and close to the pleuroperitoneal canals and they fuse with the uh, dorsal mesentery of the esophagus to form a complete uh, fusion with the septum transversum and dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. Dorsal mesentery of the esophagus which is a remnant of the after formation of intraembryonic coelom uh, the dorsal uh, connection between the uh, foregut and the dorsal body wall is the dorsal mesentery. So this mesentery fuses with the septum transversum and pleuroperitoneal folds. And the dorsal mesentery of the diaphragm is invaded by the myoblast and which forms the crura of the diaphragm and which makes the crura and this crura of the diaphragm in adults are from the myoblast of dorsal mesentery.
and lastly about the muscular ingrowth of the lateral body wall during 9th to 12th week uh, of development due to the growth of the lung buds and its peritoneal cavities into the lateral wall on each side the developing pleural cavity that is the pleuroperitoneal canals burrows into the lateral body wall further the lateral body wall it splits into two layers external and internal layers the external layer forms the definitive body wall and the internal layer forms the peripheral part of diaphragm so what we are seeing here is the internal layer so this is the internal layer which is formed by the ingrowth of lateral body wall and external layer of the lateral body wall forms a definitive body wall and internal layer after its formation it fuses it is fuses with the pericardio peritoneal membrane and septum transversum to form a complete diaphragm so let's talk about a summary of all these now so first is the septum transversum septum transversum forms the central tendon of diaphragm pleuroperitoneal membranes forms a small peripheral part of the diaphragm dorsal mesentery of the esophagus forms crura of the diaphragm so the mesoderm of the body wall it forms a large peripheral parts of the diaphragm external to parts derived from the pleuroperitoneal membrane next let us see about it position of septum transversum so during the fourth week of intrauterine life the septum transversum lies opposite to the cervical somites c3 c4 c5 so it lies here in the c3 c4 c5 region c3 c4 c5 this is c1 and c2 so we can see the development of septum transversum at the level of c3 c4 c5 so the occipital myotomes which invade into the septum transversum by forming the central tendon of diaphragm so the phrenic nerve the root value is from c3 c4 c5 but later it descends down to the thoracic level that is t7 to t12 so initially the septum transversum is present at the level of c3 c4 c5 but by the 6th week it lies at the level of t7 to t12 thoracic somites and nerve supply of the diaphragm at first the that is during fourth week of gestation uh, the septum transversum lies in the cervical region opposite to c3 c4 c5 that is cervical somites and it is supplied by corresponding cervical spinal segments that is c3 c4 and c5 and phrenic nerve the root value with c3 c4 c5 reaches the diaphragm through pleuropericardial folds so later during 6th week of intrauterine life the diaphragm descends caudally to its definitive position that is thoraco abdominal junction opposite to the level of t7 to t12 spinal segments so the descent of the diaphragm occurs due to the elongation of neck and descent of the heart and expansion of pleural cavities so these are the reasons behind the descent of the diaphragm when the diaphragm descends it carries its nerve with it hence the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve and since the peripheral parts of the diaphragm develop from the lateral body wall it receives its sensory innervation from the lower intercostal nerves so moving on to clinical correlation or congenital anomalies with the development of diaphragm so malformation of the diaphragm allows the abdominal organs to push into the chest cavity hindering proper lung formation so here in this image we can see the part of the stomach is protruded and also the intestines protruded into the thoracic cavity where the left lung is not formed properly and here is the diaphragm so we can see the abnormal protrusion of the intestines into the thoracic cavity so which is called as congenital diaphragmatic hernia which is a birth defect of diaphragm the most common type of congenital diaphragmatic hernias are bogdalic hernia morgagni hernia and diaphragm eventration and central tendon defects of diaphragm 
are the other types of congenital diaphragmatic hernias. So first we shall discuss about bagdolic hernia which is also known as posterolateral diaphragmatic hernia characterized by a hole in the posterolateral corner of the diaphragm which allows the passage of abdominal viscera into the chest cavity. So the majority of bagdolic hernias that is 80 to 85 percent of bagdolic hernia occurs on the left side of the diaphragm. So here in this image we can see uh, the demonstration of bagdolic hernia where the intestinal contents are protruded into the left side of the thoracic cavity hindering the development of left lung. The next kind of hernia is the morgagni hernia. This is a rare and uh, it occurs due to the anterior defect of diaphragm and it is variably referred to as morgagni or retrosternal or parasternal hernia and it is characterized by the herniation through the foramen of morgagni which is located immediately adjacent or posterior to the xiphoid process of the sternum. And the last type variety is the diaphragmatic eventration. The congenital diaphragmatic eventration is abnormal displacement or abnormal elevation of the diaphragm. In this condition, the musculature is one half of the diaphragm remains thin and membranous and hence it balloons out into the thorax forming a diaphragmatic pouch because of upward displacement of abdominal viscera. And this anomaly occurs when the muscular tissue does not develop in the pleuroperitoneal membrane and it is more common on the left side than on the right side. And this occurs because in the region of eventration of the diaphragm, it becomes thinner allowing the abdominal viscera to protrude upwards resulting abnormal elevation. Next about the esophageal hiatal hernia, it is the herniation of stomach through the esophageal hiatus into the pleural cavity. So normally here is the esophageal hiatus which is surrounded by the muscles and usually it is closed and collapsed only when food passes through it gets dilated. So this is esophageal hiatus. So this is esophageal opening or esophageal hiatus where we can see the cut section of esophagus passing through the diaphragm. Suppose if this esophageal hiatus is quite larger in size that is abnormally if it is large in size it results in esophageal hiatal hernia where uh, renders the that is esophagogastric sphincter is incompetent so that the stomach contents reflex into the esophagus that is called gastroesophageal reflex and uh, clinical signs of uh, newborn including vomiting which is frequently projectile vomiting and when the infant is laid on the back after feeding you can see uh, the baby uh, vomits in a projectile manner. So that is the clinical symptom of esophageal uh, hiatal hernia. So this completes the development of diaphragm. Thank you.